In our passage, Paul is、uh, largely talking about the topic of slavery, and this is not about people being slaves to other people. Rather, this is about everyone being a slave to something. This is not a slavery of the body where our body is held captive, but a slavery of the heart where our heart is held captive. Right. And how does this issue come up? It begins when Paul, playing an objector, asks the question, "What then are we to sin because we are not under law, but under grace?" And I'd like to go back one verse to verse fourteen. Verse fourteen said, "Sin will have no dominion over you, since you are not under law but under grace." So together it says, "Sin will have no dominion over you, since you are not under law but under grace." What then are we to sin, because we are not under law but under grace? Now th- this question may at first seem totally absurd. And it kind of is because it's wrong,、uh, but I'd like you to first see where it's coming from, so that we can understand Paul's train of thought. So, so first, let's make sure we understand the question that verse fifteen is asking. The question is not, "Is it okay to sin because we will not be judged by the law?" That's not the question. And you might say, "But Corbin, the verse says, 'Are we to sin because we're not under law?'" But under grace. But look, verse fourteen does not say you will not be judged since you're not under the law, but under grace. It says sin will have no dominion over you since you are not under law, but under grace. So the point Paul's making in verse fourteen is that because we're not under the law, sin doesn't have dominion over us. So when the question is asked. Are we to sin because we're not under the law? It means, are we to sin because sin does not have dominion over us? So this question comes from the mindset of, well, we've been set free from sin. Sin does not have dominion over us. We're not slaves to anything. Nothing rules us. We are our own masters. We're autonomous and free. Therefore. We can choose to do whatever we want. We can choose to sin. It's not sin dominating us. It's us choosing sin, right? That that's the mindset of the question. Are we to sin because sin doesn't have dominion over us, since we are not under law but under grace? So, how does Paul respond to this question? Well. In verse sixteen, he says, "By no means do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin which leads to death, or of obedience which leads to righteousness." So, if we offer ourselves to anyone, submit to anyone, or obey anyone. Then we are slaves to that which we obey. If we obey sin, then we are slaves of sin. If we obey righteousness, then we are slaves of righteousness. So, please realize, being free in this sense is not an option. We cannot be free. We are either slaves to sin, or slaves to righteousness. And this is why. After we've been set free from sin, we can't just decide to freely offer ourselves back up to sin again. It's because we're not free. If sin doesn't have dominion over us, then righteousness does. And clearly, if righteousness has dominion over us, then we cannot present ourselves to obey sin as our life pattern. As Paul explains in verses seventeen and eighteen, but thanks be to God that you who were once slaves of sin have become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching to which you were committed, and having been set free from sin, 
have become slaves of righteousness. So again, th this is why it is wrong to think that once we are set free from sin, we can then use that freedom to choose to live sinfully. Paul, Paul is saying, no, it doesn't work like that. Once our hearts are set free from slavery to sin, we are made slaves of righteousness. Right? We, we cannot be our own master. We will either have Christ as our master or we will have Satan as our master. And the, there's an important application that these verses have. You see, Paul was refuting a certain idea, the idea that we can be freed from sin's power, but then still just decide to go on living sinfully. He, he explained that this idea is wrong because when we are set free from sin, we are enslaved to righteousness, and therefore will live righteously because that is our nature. We become obedient from the heart. And, and why is this important? The answer is because many people believe uh, this false view that Paul was responding to. People think that after the Spirit sets them free, they can then choose to live a sinful life. But, but they're not in bondage, they're not slaves. It's just them being free and choosing sin, right? But again, that is not how this works. God frees us from sin's mastery so that he can be our master. Now, in 2 Corinthians 13, verse 5, Paul wrote, Examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Or do you not realize this about yourselves, that Jesus Christ is in you, unless indeed you fail to meet the test? So, Paul was writing to the church at Corinth, and he told the church to examine themselves to see whether they were really saved, whether they were really in the faith. So we as a church should examine ourselves to see whether we are truly saved, right? And how can we know if we're saved? Well, our passage said, you who were once slaves of sin have become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching to which you were committed, and having been set free from sin, have become slaves of righteousness. So true Christians are obedient from the heart. So we should ask ourselves, do, do I actually want to obey Scripture? Is my heart obedient? Am I a slave to righteousness? Remember, when God saves us, he makes us slaves of righteousness. So if you are not a slave of righteousness, then you are not saved. Now, please understand, I, this does not mean that, that Christians are totally righteous. We're not. In James chapter 2, verse 2, he said the simple sentence, we all stumble in many ways. We all stumble in many ways. So, so stumbling does not mean you're not saved. We all sin. But still, even though we stumble, true Christians will get back up. We will always come back to righteousness because we are slaves of righteousness. We will repent and continue to pursue obedience to God because our hearts are driving us to obedience. Right? So in light of these teachings, we should examine ourselves to see if we are saved. Are we slaves of sin or slaves of righteousness, right? So to summarize what we've looked at so far uh, in verses 15 through 18. Um, so, so Paul, playing an objector, asked the question, now that sin doesn't have dominion over us, can we still obey sin? When we're saved, do we have the freedom to be our own master? Can we be saved and still present ourselves to sin? And Paul answered, no. When we are saved, we are both freed from sin and enslaved to righteousness. Christians are not their own masters. Our hearts are devoted to God. And so in light of that, we can examine ourselves 
to see if we are truly in the faith. We can look at our lives to determine whether we are obedient to sin or obedient to righteousness as the pattern of our life. Now, going on to verse 19... Uh, verse 19, we read, I'm speaking in human terms because of your natural limitations. So, so this is why Paul is using the language of slavery. Instead of just straight up talking about spiritual truths and totally confusing us all, he's using the familiar concept of slavery to help explain the spiritual truths he's teaching. And basically what Paul is teaching here, please understand this, is the biblical doctrine of the heart. And, and we preach a lot about the heart here, and that's because the Bible talks a lot about the heart. So being a slave of sin or a slave of righteousness is essentially the same as having a good or bad heart. We lead a sinful life because we're slaves of sin. We lead a righteous life because we're slaves of righteousness. Or you could say, we lead a bad life because we have a bad heart. Or we lead a good life because we have a good heart. As Luke 6, 45 says, the good person out of the good treasure of his heart produces good. And the evil person out of his evil Treasure produces evil. So when Paul is talking about slavery either to sin or righteousness, he's talking about the inclination of our hearts either to sin or righteousness. Before we are saved, our hearts desire sin. When God saves us, he changes our hearts so that our hearts desire righteousness. And to help us understand that idea, Paul talks about how we were slaves to sin and then became slaves to righteousness, right? So the rest of verse 19 says, For just as you once presented your members as slaves to impurity and to lawlessness, leading to more lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves to righteousness, leading to sanctification. So earlier we saw that you must be either a slave to sin or to righteousness. But, but now we see that there is even more to it than that. Lawlessness leads to more lawlessness, and righteousness leads to sanctification or, or more righteousness. So you have to be on one side of the fence or the other, and you will be increasing. You don't stay where you are, right? Right? If you are a slave of sin, you will be increasing in your sinfulness. And if you are a slave of righteousness, you will be increasing in your righteousness. And, and that is because God is the one sanctifying us. He is working in us to make us more like Christ, right? Um, but, but why do sinful people become more sinful? I'd like to take just a little bit of time to talk about this. Because it, it might not really seem like this is the case. Um, probably all of us, at, at least I myself, know people who are not Christians, but they don't seem like terrible people. Uh, and they don't seem to become more and more sinful as time passes. Um, I, I'm sure we all know people who are not believers, but who are nice and friendly and fun to hang out with, right? Right? But I, I want us to remember something. Being a sinful person, be, being a slave of sin, d doesn't just mean being mean or cruel to other people. Sin does not have so much to do with how we relate to other people as it does how we relate to God. What I'm saying is that a person could be kind to you and yet be sinning because they are not doing it for God. Their actions do not come from a love for God, but a, a desire for something else that does not include him. Quickly, please turn your Bibles to Romans chapter 10. 
the beginning of Romans chapter 10. So, uh, at the beginning of this chapter, Paul is talking about the Israelites. And he says, Brothers, my heart's desire and prayer to God for them is that they may be saved. So these people are not saved. Therefore, they're slaves of sin, right? So we're reading about slaves of sin. And Paul says, I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. For being ignorant of the righteousness of God and seeking to establish their own, they did not submit to God's righteousness. So these people are zealous for God. They are trying to be good. They're seeking to establish their own righteousness. And yet they are sinning because they will not accept God's righteousness. They're basically saying, no, I don't want Christ. I don't need Christ. I can be good enough on my own. And then they go off and do a bunch of really good stuff and be really nice to people. And, and yet you see they are doing it in rebellion against God, in rejection of his gospel. And therefore they are doing it in sin. So please, please understand, when we talk about things like slavery to sin or, or total depravity, those teachings don't mean that everyone in the world is a murdering and thieving and treacherous monster that will try to kill you every time they see you, okay? But it does mean that none of the things that they do are done for Christ, their, their hearts are slaves to sin. Their hearts do not love Christ. Nothing they do comes out of a love for Christ. And therefore, everything they do falls short of righteousness. So it is all counted as sin. And furthermore, in Romans chapter 1, verses 1 and 24, we read... For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him. But they became futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Therefore, God gave them up in the lusts of their hearts to impurity. So, so slaves of sin, even the ones that appear to be kind and fair to people, they do not honor God. And because of that, God gives them over to their sin. He gives them up to greater and greater lawlessness. And so they increase in their sin. That is, they increase in their rebellion against him and their hatred of him. So that, that was verse 19, which said, for just as you presented your members as slaves to impurity and to lawlessness, leading to more lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves to righteousness, leading to sanctification. And then going on to the rest of our passage, we read, for when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. But what fruit were you getting at that time from the things of which you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves of God, the fruit you get leads to sanctification and its end, eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So earlier I said that you have to be a slave. And that's true, but verse 20 says, when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. So it is also true that you have to be free, right? If you're a slave to sin, then you're free from righteousness. If you're a slave of righteousness, then you're free from sin. Not entirely, but still. Still. 
Um, and, and yeah, we, we see that we're, even being a slave of righteousness, we're not entirely free from sin in 1 John. In 1 John chapter 1, verses 6 through 8, we read, If we say we have fellowship with him, that is God, while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. So even believers, those who walk in the light, cannot say that we are without sin. We're not fully free from sin, but sin is no longer our master. We do not walk in darkness. Our dominant life pattern is not one of rejecting God's truth and disobeying him. If it is, then you do not have fellowship with God. And, and I'd like to ask the question, like, why does this matter? We have to be a slave to sin or righteousness, but why is one better than the other? Why would we want to go from being a slave to one thing to being a slave of another thing, right? Uh, that is the question that the last part of our passage answers. So starting at verse 21, we read, But what fruit were you getting at that time from the things of which you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves of God, the fruit you get leads to sanctification and its end, eternal life. So, so remember, you can't be on the fence. You're either on one side as a slave to sin or you're on the other as a slave to righteousness. And also, you don't remain where you are. Everyone is progressing. You either progress in your sin or you progress in your righteousness. God is either sanctifying you, making you more and more like Christ, or he is handing you over to your sin, leaving you to become more and more wicked. And, and then finally, we reach the end and we get our reward, right? The wicked progress in their wickedness until they receive their just reward, which is death. And God progresses the righteous in their righteousness until they receive what Christ earned for them, which is life. And, and I want to make sure we are understanding what these terms life and death mean, because it is more than just physically dying, right? Because, I mean, in fact, clearly we all die. Christians die, right? We still receive physical death, but not the death that this passage is talking about, right? So, so first, what does it mean to have life? In John 17, verse 3, we read, This is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. So to have life in its fullness means to have fellowship with God. It means to know him, to delight in his glory, right? And then on the other side, we have death. In Revelation 20 verses 12 through 15, we read, And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and the books were opened. Then another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged by what was written in the books, according to what they had done. And the sea gave up the dead who were in it. Death and Hades gave up the dead who were in them. And they were judged, each one of them, according to what they had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. So to receive the death that this passage is talking about means to be thrown into the lake of fire. It is an eternity of hell, right? So, 
Everyone's life can be described by one of two stories, right? In the first, you are born a slave of sin, continue in bondage to sin, progress in your sin, and finally receive the death that you earned. In the second, you are born a slave of sin, but God sets you free and enslaves you to righteousness, and you progress in righteousness, and finally you receive the life that Christ earned for you. As verse 23 says, for the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. We can get death on our own, but life is only gotten in Christ. You see, Jesus earned life for himself through his own obedience and his own righteousness. And then he willingly represents us, so we are included in him. We are counted as Christ, and therefore we receive the life he earned, which is an eternity of fellowship with God. So I would like to finish with three closing thoughts. First, we've seen that each individual is either a slave of sin or a slave of righteousness. And the way we determine which one rules you is by looking at, at which one you obey. So therefore, we should examine ourselves, right? We, we must not waltz through life not knowing if we're on the way to heaven or hell, right? Examine yourself. Examine your actions and your thoughts and your desires. Ask godly people what they think. Pray for wisdom, right? So first of all, examine yourself. Secondly, if you are not saved, if you examine yourself and determine you are not saved, then I pray that you would see how dire your situation is. You are a slave to a cruel master who is going to kill you forever. And you are also currently free from everything good and right. So by God's grace, recognize that and come to Christ. He is a good master. He walks beside you and leads you into the life that he died to bring you. Jesus stands ready to receive all who come to him. So come to him. And finally, if you are saved, then, then be encouraged. You are free from your former bondage. You no longer have to submit to sin. You are free to delight in God. And also remember, the Christian life isn't static. You don't stay where you are. You progress. So again, be encouraged. Your life story is going to be one of godliness that increases and increases and increases, slowly but surely, until the day when you are perfected. Proverbs 4, verse 18 says, The path of the righteous is like the light of dawn, which shines brighter and brighter until full day. Your life is going to shine brighter and brighter until the day when you perfectly reflect the glory of your Savior. God began this work in you, freeing you from sin, and he will bring it to completion. So let us rejoice in that. And I, I don't mean to suggest that the Christian life is easy or painless, but it is joyful. The more God sanctifies us, the more we will love him. And the more we love him, the more joy we will have in him. So we are truly a blessed people, and we have much to look forward for. I'd like to say one more thing before we close. So you see, God is the one who sanctifies us, but he sanctifies us through certain means, right? Right? 
God does not zap you in your sleep and make you like Christ, okay? Um, it's through certain means, and one of those is the word of God. Please turn to John 17, 17. And I, I would recommend memorizing this verse. I, I would submit to you that this is one of the most important verses for the Christian life. In John chapter 17, verse 17, Jesus is praying to the Father, and he says, Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. So let me encourage you to read the word of God. When we read scripture, God sanctifies us. When God sanctifies us, we find greater joy and satisfaction in Christ. And, and guess what? You all just heard a sermon. So uh, l- listen to me. I really believe this. You are more godly now than when you sat down an hour ago. And of course, it's just a little bit. But, but still, when you hear the word of God, God is sanctifying you right? Every day when you sit down to read the Bible, you are more godly when you stand up and leave than you were when you sat down. So, so it, it is this book that will cause your life to shine brighter and brighter until the day of perfection. So, so let us be encouraged and let us devote ourselves to the Word of God. <laughs>